Good day to everyone out there. Uh, my name is Lee Gehring, and uh, I am the manager and director of the eponymous investment firm, Gehring & Rosenzweig Associates, a firm that is dedicated to researching and investing in, in, in global natural resource markets. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about copper and the importance of copper supply. Uh, as most of you know, there's been a huge amount of press uh, put out there about the, the tremendous uh, demand strains that are put on the copper market going forward through this decade because of uh, various factors, including incredible copper intensity of renewables. However, one of the things that people have not been focusing on is all the problems that developed in supply, which means that the copper market this decade is going to develop what we call a structural deficit, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end. Uh, I should point out that uh, the copper markets are something that we have spent years studying here at Gehring and Rosenzweig uh, Associates, and it's something that we, we, we know pretty well. You know, copper supply has spent another year, a disappointing year in 2020, and we believe there are a bunch of very good reasons for this to, to happen. And it's there, these reasons are are going to be repeated over and go over again as we progress through this decade. That's what I'm going to talk about. Regarding the supply of the copper markets, we have been at the we at the firm here, Gary and Rose's White Associates, been at the forefront in identifying the various problems that have crept into into copper mine supply over the last decade, especially as it has evolved around the issue of copper mine depletion, which is an abstract concept that few people outside the insiders in the copper industry have uh, spent much in the way of time uh, aggressively pursuing. For those uh, that are interested in some of the research that we have done on copper, I refu refer you to the Gehring and Roses Y website where our research is cataloged. We put out a very, very detailed quarterly uh, letter that's, that is dedicated to events in global natural resource markets and the research that we're doing. And it has a very wide following. And, and I especially want you to, to take a look at, at the lead essay that appeared in our first quarter 2021 letter uh, with, it was titled, The Problem with Copper Supply. And in that essay, I discussed the long-term problems that are bedeviling the copper industry. For those that want a more in-depth discussion of what I'm gonna talk about today, please go back to, to our website uh, and, and look at what, what's in that, that essay. Uh, the biggest short-term problem we have today in the copper mine supply base is that it's suffering from a depletion issue. Uh, depletion is an, is an abstract concept, but as far as the, the copper mining industry goes, to make it simple, I want to concentrate on the fact that copper companies are being forced to mine lower and lower quality and grade ore. Harvard Business School teaches the industry to mine their the best or first, it gives the highest profit. But this means by definition that ultimately the lower grade ore uh, is the only one, the ore that's remaining. And at some point, th this becomes a huge problem. In the 1980s, 1990s, there, was, there were so many brand new mines that were brought into production that the issue of mining lower grade ore was hidden but behind all the brand new uh, ore that was being brought on with these big new high grade mines. However, the number of new high-grade uh, copper mines coming online in the last 10 years has dropped precipitously, and the problem of, of, former, mine, so, um, of former mines being highly aggressively high-graded uh, has become a much more bigger and noticeable problem. How, how big a problem? I'm going to give you a, a great example of this problem with a, a real live example that, that is operationally taking place literally just right in front of us. As, as some of you might know, Chilean copper mine supply is, un, has, is unexpectedly disappointed by a huge amount in 2022 versus 2021. Most copper analysts believe that Chilean copper supply in 2022 would be flat versus 2021. However, when the year ended, ended up, copper supply was down over 6% year over year. Uh, why? A, a number of reasons have been given, um, delays in brownfill mine development, water issues, labor and rust, labor unrest and related mine stoppages. But the biggest problem has to do with the miner of mining of lower and, and, and lower quality copper ore. 
And the reason is, is very important because what goes on in Chile has significant implications for the rest of the global copper supply. Uh, Chile's copper supply represents over 20% of world copper mine supply in itself. So let me, let me give you a real life example of this problem uh, as it's unfolding right in front of us. Escondida is by far the world's largest copper mine, not only in Chile, but the world as well. Uh, discovered back in the early 1980s and starting production in the early 1990s, Escondida back then was a brand new mine, but it's now it's starting to really showing its age. Back in 2014, Escondida's owners, which are Rio Tinto, Zinc, and, and, and um, BHP, announced a massive $7 billion capital campaign to bring the mine's production back to 1.2 million tons of copper production per year, which had fallen the previous uh, several years down to about 800,000 tons. By 2018, the capital investment plan plan was complete, and the mine's copper production had climbed back up to 1.2 million tons per year. In 2018, Canadian mined ore, uh, the Escondida mined ore that had a, a head grade, that is a measurement of the quality, amount of copper contained in that ore, um, almost 1%, which I should point out is down from 1.4% uh, just four years previously. But However, in just four short years, the head grade of Escondida's mined ore, mined ore has now fallen by 20%. Instead of mining ore that contains 1% copper, Escondida in 2024 mined ore that it contained only 0.78% copper. Escondida's uh, copper's uh, production fell by over 20% in the last four years, and it fell 6% last year alone, all because the quality of ore that was being mined has been dropping significantly. And our analysis is telling us that the remaining ore contained Escondida deposit uh, is, going, is, is going to suffer future hand grade drops as well. And future production disappointments are all but guaranteed. Escondida is just one mine, although it's a big one, but our an analysis tells us this drop in ore quality is being repeated over and over again across huge swaths of the copper mining industry. According to our research, we believe declining copper ore grades, a sure sign of mine depletion problems, are going to make, make growing copper supply an almost impossible challenge as we progress through this decade. But there are other short-term factors that are, work that, that are uh, um, impacting copper supply on a much shorter-term basis. Uh, it's not only falling head grades that are bedeviling the copper industry today. Uh, over the last several years, populist governments in Chile, Peru, Bolivia, and Panama have proposed severely increasing the royalties and fiscal regimes under which these mines operate. The most recent and high-profile dispute has been emerged in Panama, the home of the massive, that is, they produce 300,000 tons of copper production a year, the Cobra Panama mine, where the Panamanian government uh, has declared the 2018 mining law under which Cobra Panama operates to be unconstitutional. The government wants to hike the royalty on the mine, or the royalty the mine pays from 2% to 16%. And the government also wants First Quantum, which is the owner operator of the mine, to guarantee a minimum payment of $375 million per year to the government, no, no matter how much copper the, the mine produces or how much profit the mine produces. First Quantum, uh, in response to these, this, this extremely onerous demand, is threatening to cease operations of the mine, and negotiators are continuing uh, with the government uh, to, to settle uh, this dispute. However, at this time, both sides remain far apart. Also, civil unrest in Peru, driven by political turmoil, has now forced the closure of two large Peruvian copper mines, Glencore's Antipacaque mine and uh, MMG's, which is a Chinese company, the Los Bombas project. Uh, these mines produce 470,000 tons of co combined copper, and these two mines alone represent 2% of total world production. How long unrest continues in Peru and how long these mines remain blockaded is no one knows. But Peru has become a real powerhouse in global copper production over the last decade. And its production now represents about 9% of total world supply. So what happens in Peru going forward uh, has it was going to have a huge impact on short-term copper mine supply. 
increasing unrest in many South African, I'm sorry, South American countries is another factor that clouds the industry's ability to make huge investments in copper projects in countries with declining political, social, and taxation regimes. And let me finish with another observation regarding copper supply. The ultimate source of copper supply comes from the copper mining industry's ability to replace the copper produced with new copper found in the ground. Between the mid-1970s and the late 1990s, the mining industry was able to bring on a large number of supply uh, from high-quality uh, new mines. For example, uh, I've talked about Escondida. It was discovered in the early 1980s, and production started in the early 1990s. Um, and production started in the early 1990s from the, from the massive Grassburg copper mine, which was discovered back in the late 1980s. Also, we also had the introduction in the late 1980s of a, the introduction of a new extraction technology to the copper mining industry. That is SXCW, solvent extraction electro winnowing, which allowed for the first time the mining of copper oxide ore. Beforehand, copper oxide ore deposits could never be mined as the cost to extract the copper from this ore was non-economic. Huge copper oxide deposits, previously discovered but left undeveloped, could now be brought into production for the first time. SXEW derived copper supply surged in the 1990s. Uh, and as all these previously discovered projects, many of them huge, which we knew where they were, all came online. However, over the last 15 years, the number of new world-class copper deposit discoveries has shrunk tremendously. And the number of new world-class deposits coming online today is significantly less than it was 20 years ago. Although the copper industry has been able to replace their production with reserves over the last decade, our analysis tells us that almost all this reserve replacement has come about not because of new discoveries, but because the industry uh, has uh, brought about of uh, lowering its cutoff grade. Because of high gop, uh, copper prices, uh, that remember copper prices back in the early 2000s were only 60 cents, 60 cents, and today they stand at $4.20. These higher prices meant that lower and lower quality ore could be, previously be mined. Previously, it was, de it was determined to be non-economic. Now it's economic. This has been one of the huge sources, if not the primary source of reserve replacement over the last decade. For those that consider themselves ge geology wonks, there's another issue here that's very, it turns out, as far as copper deposits. It turns out the di distribution of reserve grades in copper porphyry deposits, and remember copper porphyry deposits represent about 80% of copper world mine supply, are what's called log normally distributed which means that from here on out, higher prices from copper prices from here will do very little for the industry to be able to bring on new copper reserves, which was the, the big trick over the last decade. This is a hugely important issue, which is not understood by anyone other than copper geologists and mining engineers, but it's important. And if you're interested, please refer back to that paper that I was talking about, uh, Problem of Copper Supply that appeared in our first quarter, 2021, letter, which can be accessed from the Gehring and Rosenzweig website. Because of the Green Revolution, uh, which will necessarily make us much more electricity focused, copper demand is set to surge this decade. However, based upon our supply uh, analysis, these copper demand needs can't be met. And because of the copper's uh, market's inability to grow, copper that is grow copper supply, the copper market on a global basis is in the process of slipping today from surplus into what we like to call structural deficit. And the only way for the copper market to balance uh, uh, away the structural deficit going forward as we progress through this decade is through much, much higher prices. For those that are interested in following what we say here at Gehring and Rosenzweig Associates, please go to our website. As I mentioned, or we write a very, very detailed quarterly letter that's centered on the news and, and events that are happening in, in various global natural resources and commodity markets and the, the research that, we're, uh, that we've undertake, undertaken and in the process of doing. And uh, we have a big following and all that research is available. Uh, it's in the public domain. So just go to our website and uh, all our letters going back over the last seven years are there.